Okay. Um, we began talking about uh, um, a very quick uh, overview of, of uh, sheaf theory. So let me just remind you of, of where this goes. Uh, so in the general discussion that we were having, I framed things in the language of uh, sheaves of uh, sets. Okay. Okay, so we said we were talking about things defined over uh, a topological space S, so O sub S are the open sets, and the idea was for uh, every open set U, we define a, uh, um, a set, okay? And then there was the property of this, uh, properties of this that I wrote down, uh, the most important really having to do with restrictions, okay? So I, I defined that all last time. Um, and this, this, the property of restrictions allows you to define um, the, uh, stock of this pre sheaf at a point x uh, to be just symbolically, I just I described it explicitly uh, last time. Okay, so you take the um, <coughs> the neighborhoods n sub x of uh, of x as a directed set, and and the stock is the direct limit of this directed set. So again, I defined that explicitly last time. Okay, <clears throat> and then the uh, FLA space um, was the union of all these stocks, like that. Okay, and then we gave this uh, uh, a topology. Okay, and so the base for the topology was sets that looked like this. So we had open sets U of S and um, lo a local section S of, uh, so S was in F of U, okay? And the basis for the FLA topology, um, uh, the basis sets looked like this. So you take um, germs of this local section at a point X over all the points X in U. Okay, so that gave us some, uh, uh, the Etale topology. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right, and uh, as the lecture ended, I was beginning to talk about morphisms of pre sheaves. And so if you have. two pre sheaves F and G, and again, we're just gonna be thinking about, for simplicity and concreteness, uh, pre sheaves of sets. Um, a morphism, uh, phi, is also a family of mappings. Okay, one for, uh, uh, and maybe it's, because these are mappings, maybe I'll write it as phi sub u. Okay, so these are mappings which go from, um, uh, f of u into uh, g of u, okay? And the, the property that they have is that they commute with restrictions. Okay, so we have these restriction mappings. Uh, and I'll just write them both as r, although they're for different pre sheaves. Okay, so v is an uh, u and v are open, v is a subset of u. So you have uh, um, the commuting of re restriction with these morphisms. And so what this uh, restriction property leads to <clears throat> is that you have um, a mapping between the FLA spaces, which is defined in more or less uh, the obvious way. Um, so uh, uh, the F uh, to A of this mapping T <clears throat> applied to, okay, so we're going to apply it to uh, a germ, 
okay? So it's gonna be an equivalence class of so section U over an open set U, or sorry, a, 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 a local section S over an open set U, and take its germ at X, and this will be um, uh, the germ of phi sub U applied to S uh, at X. Okay. All right, so this is a, um, a map that maps stocks uh, at X to, uh, sorry, germs at X to germs at X, so it preserves the stocks. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so um, uh, the why do I want to talk about morphisms of pre-sheaves? Because what I want to do is I want to talk about um, uh, the equivalence between kind of two uh, separate ways of thinking about a sheaf. One uh, way of thinking about a sheaf is that it's one of these guys um, with certain properties. So I, I listed these properties last time. Uh, there was one property which was which I call the separation property, um, which means that local sections are uh, determined um, uh, by what they do at points in a neighborhood. Okay, they're uniquely determined by that. Uh, and then the gluing property, um, which says that if you uh, know uh, a local section on neighborhoods that, and they are they patch together in the right way, uh, then that thing can be a global section. Okay, so there was two properties of a pre-sheaf that made it into a sheaf. Um, and there's a different way of thinking about a, 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 a sheaf, and it's like this. Um, okay, so if, uh, so we're gonna let, uh, F be a pre sheaf with actually space um, okay. so we're going to define another pre sheaf <coughs> this pre sheaf will be PS of ET of F Okay, so um, what I need to do uh, is I need to tell you what the mappings are, uh, sorry, what the, what the local sections of this pre-sheaf are over an open set U. Okay, so it's going to be PS of ET of F of U. Okay, so this is going to be what the local sections are. <clears throat> um, and so these are, by definition, um, uh, this is really... Um, actually, let me look at it this way. So it's um, um, mappings sigma, okay, from U uh, into uh, the FLA space of F, okay, with some properties. So first of all, um, sigma is going to take a point X in U and it's going to map it to a germ at X, okay. So um, sigma of X is in the germ at X, <clears throat> so it's a section. Okay, um, and sigma should be continuous. Okay, and so of course here I have the topology on S, and here I have the etale topology. Okay, and then the relatively easy fact here is that um, uh, so here's here's morphisms of sheaves, and of course. Um, uh, their isomorphism, the, uh, a morphism of is an isomorphism of each of these guys is an isomorphism, and so what I have is that if F is a uh, is a sheaf, then it's isomorphic to P S and T of F. And I will actually write down what the mapping is between uh, uh, the two things. So this is a really a morphism of, of pre-sheaves. So I'll call it a morphism. Okay, what is the what is the mapping? Well, it, it's uh, all of this stuff is pretty obvious if you think about it for a second. There's only really one way to do this um, to find given by. Okay, so it's going to be uh, alpha sub u. Okay, so a morphism. Um, is defined one for each open set U. 
Okay, and so what alpha sub u needs to do is it needs to take a local section of f and map it to a local section of this tree sheet. Okay, <clears throat> so it's going to take a local section s. Okay, so s here is in f of u. Okay, this guy I'm telling you is um, uh, in P S of e T of U. Okay, so therefore, this alpha U of S is a mapping from U into the FLA space. So therefore, it's a candidate to be evaluated at a point X in U. Okay, and of course, once you write this down, there's only one possibility here. Okay, <clears throat> so the fact is that this is. Um, it is an isomorphism if f is a sheaf. Okay. And so there's a very confusing but convenient uh, uh, identification that gets made when you're talking about sheaves. And that is, if f is a sheaf, um, you will sometimes think of a local section of the sheaf as being a local section of that without actually saying that that's what you're doing. Okay, okay so the sheaves F, okay, so I'm assuming that F is a sheaf, right? So if F is a sheaf, um, you often uh, identify it with um, its pre-sheaf of uh, uh, local sections of the et al. space. And it's obviously convenient because, you know, the, the, this is my own personal notation for these things. It's not necessarily the standard notation, but whatever standard notation you use, it's going to be um, uh, a lot simpler to just think of that. Okay? <clears throat> so these are often identified. Without um, being, being explicit. Okay. Yeah. When F is not a sheaf, do we have injective? Yeah, it's an injective mapping, but definitely not subjective. That's the and, thing, basically. I'm sorry? Lack of the blooming property. Uh, that's right. Well, both things can fail. Or both injectivity? Uh, so I guess if the sheaf, if the pre-sheaf doesn't have the separation property, then that mapping will not be injective, okay? Um, um, because stocks don't determine uniquely what happens, right? Um, yeah, but the gluing property uh, uh, will be associated with lack of surjectivity. Yeah, and the, that bounded vector field example I gave last time is a good way to think about that, because the stocks um, are just the stocks of the whole sheaf, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> yeah, I, the separation property is not going to be interesting for us. It just, it, in many, many uh, applications of sheath theory, uh, that property is not such a, um, uh, it's always present uh, just by the framework. So for us, it always will be. Yeah. So it's the gluing property that's most interesting for us. Okay, <clears throat> all right, good. So, um, so good. Um, all right, now let's think about uh, how we are going to uh, use all this business about sheaves. So in the, in the many common usages of sheaf theory, the key thing that you end up wanting to use is what's called uh, sheaf cohomology. Um, uh, that we're, we're going to go in a different direction with this. Really, the structure that we're going to use here is the Atelier space structure, and then I forgot, uh, there's another structure that I'm going to define, another topological structure that I'm going to define right now, and then I'll tell you about how we're going to use sheaf theory. Okay, so the thing I want to talk about now is what's called the uh, stock topology. Okay, now, so I've been talking about sheaves of sets. <clears throat> Now we're going to have topologies. Uh, um, so f of u is going to be, so f will be a, a pre-sheaf of um, topological spaces of some sort. Okay, so 
we're going to be thinking about two kinds of topological spaces, just sort of general topological spaces, but also um, or of uh, locally convex spaces. So locally convex topological vector spaces. Okay, so the, the two types of topological sheaves that we're going to talk about are these. Okay, so in this case, <clears throat> okay, f of u, okay, is not um, uh, uh, a set, it's a topological space. or a locally convex topological space. So you, uh, let me just say topological space for simplicity. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. So I take a point X in uh, S. Um, then I have the stock topology. on the stock. It's the um, final topology uh, associated with X is a neighbor, sorry, U is a neighborhood of X, and uh, this is the mapping which maps a local section over U to its germ. Okay, so this will be a mapping from F of U into the stock. Okay, I, I defined this last time. Okay, so these mappings are over all the neighborhoods of X. <clears throat> okay, and so this is the final topology associated with uh, this family of mappings. Now, um, in the locally convex case, okay, there's a little thing you have to be slightly cautious of, and it's this. Um, so uh, the final topology um, can be thought of in two different senses. All right, so if f of u is a uh, locally convex space, okay, um, then just as a set, Okay, so if I take the direct limit of these locally convex spaces, just as vector spaces, the direct limit will be a vector space. You take the direct limit in the category of vector spaces. Okay, now <clears throat> there's um, two ways to put topologies on that. One is to think of these as being um, just topological spaces. So in that case, um, these restriction mappings, you, you do exactly what I just said. The stock topology on this vector space will be the final topology associated with these mappings. That's one way to do it. Okay. The other way to do it is to um, note that these mappings are linear. Okay. So from this locally convex space into this vector space, okay. then um, there will be a finest, uh, um, I think finest, uh, locally convex topology here which makes all of these linear maps continuous. Generally, those two topologies will not be the same. So what I'm saying is this, is that if you have a direct limit in the category of vector spaces, okay, and you, uh, the vector spaces here are locally convex, then the direct limit in the category of topological spaces and the direct limit in the category of locally convex spaces may be different, okay? I'm sorry, uh, is there any guarantee that the topology on uh, f of x is making f of x a topological space? Um, uh, if these are locally convex, there's always uh, uh, a final topology. Yes, that's that's it's locally it's convex. It's a, it's a topology. It, that's locally convex. That, that's true. Yes, what, what about considering just uh, them as a topological space? Um, and defining the final topology on f of x. Oh, we so will that topology be locally convex? Is that what you're asking? Uh, is that topology ever linear? Not necessarily. No, and that's that's one of the ways in which they can differ, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So generally, when these are locally convex spaces, it's the direct limit in the category of locally convex 
spaces that you want to consider, and you should just be aware of the fact that it's not the same as the direct limit in the category of topological spaces. And one of the things that's kind of unresolved um, is whether um, they are the same for the examples that we're dealing with. The answer, I don't know the answer to that question in a lot of cases. I, I'm guessing they are, but I don't know. Okay, but it's, but it's something you should be aware of when you're talking about direct limits of locally convex spaces. It's not the same as the direct limit, the topological direct limit. <clears throat> okay, so that's the stock topology. All right? Okay, good. Um, so now, uh, oh, so let me maybe um, uh, say a few words about the stock topology um, on this sheaf. Um, Okay, so this, remember, was the uh, sheaf of C nu sections uh, of the tangent bundle, so the sheaf of C nu vector fields. Okay? All right. Um, so then uh, um, you have then the germs at X um, in M are denoted. Um, G nu T M X like that. Okay, and then so by this construction here, you have the stock topology on, on uh, that vector space. Okay, the vector space of germs of C nu vector fields. Okay, so the stock topology. <clears throat> sort of say in words um, in some of the other cases uh, um, why they're, uh, the way in which they're not Hausdorff. Um, <coughs> so um, take nu equals infinity, okay? So then what do we have? We have germs of smooth vector fields, okay? Um, when will two, the two germs of smooth vector fields not be separated, uh, two distinct germs of uh, smooth vector fields not be separated by neighborhoods in the stock topology. Okay, so in what way is this not Hausdorff? Well, um, it turns out you, you can show relatively easily that uh, the vector fields should, their infinite jets should agree at x, okay, if and only if. Okay? So two vector fields whose, two germs of vector fields whose infinite jets agree at x, okay, um, uh, uh, if those vector fields, the germs are distinct, the neighborhoods will also be distinct, okay? Um, and so for um, finitely differentiable, uh, it's the same kind of thing. The, not the infinite jet, but the finite jet, whatever jet it is that you're talking about. Um, uh, if the finite jets are the same, uh, then the vector fields will not be separated in the stock topology, okay? All right. So generally speaking, um, what you'll maybe want to do in those cases when the stock topology is not Hausdorff is you'll want to pass to the quotient. Okay, so you'll quotient out by the um, uh, um, uh, the subspace uh, of uh, uh, things that are that agree, and that that topology will be Hausdorff. Okay. <clears throat> All right, but in the, uh, the analytic case is somehow very interesting for us, so it's nice that that's how it works. Okay, good. So why, do I, why am I using uh, sheaf theory? Well, um, when we come to talk about tautological spaces, we'll see um, there uh, some reasons why. Here, I just want to think about this in the, in the world of just vector fields. And I'm kind of motivated with something which is rather control theory-like. Okay. Um, for the picture, okay. So suppose I have uh, uh, some neighborhood here, okay. And on this neighborhood, okay, 
I have uh, a vector field, let's say y defined, and y uh, points off like this. Okay, and then on some other neighborhood, okay, I have a vector field x, and this vector field points like so. Okay, now you could take the vector fields x and y, and you could you know, apply cutoff functions to them and um, make them globally defined. Um, but maybe there's natural, maybe there's reasons why you really want to consider the domains of these things to be what I drew. Okay, so these are really, really just locally defined vector fields. So for example, I can imagine this being uh, something you might do in some version of hybrid control theory. Okay, All right. So, so this you might think of a trajectory here as being an integral curve which goes here and then up here like this. Okay, so this will be, um, uh, this curve that I've just drawn will be an integral curve, perfectly nice integral curve for a perfectly nice time varying vector field, namely the one that's x along here and then uh, y along here. Um, but if you were to think about uh, drawing these in time versus space, Okay, uh, you might have a situation where um, they're defined on neighborhoods okay, um, that aren't square. Okay, so you might have uh, um, um, defined like uh, this here. Okay, so it'll be x on this part, uh, and then y on this part. Okay. Um, but there will be no interval here and no neighborhood here, so that this is a time-varying vector field on, um, so there's no, you know, u here and t here, so that this vector field is naturally defined on the product of t cross u. So in other words, it's defined on an open subset of R cross m, okay, but not a, not a square one, okay? So there's lots of good reasons you can think of about why you'd want to consider things like this. And um, so, and you can imagine doing all manner of ad hocery to get around that, okay? Um, and coming up with, uh, you know, rather complicated definitions. Um, but I believe the chief theory gives you a much nicer way of, of doing this, uh, although you have to pay the baggage of uh, understanding chief theory. Okay, so what, what I really want to do is I want to talk about um, Um, okay, so we have an interval, and we have a manifold. Okay, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about the sheaf of time-varying vector fields on T cross M. Okay, because what do I get to do if I'm talking about a sheaf of time-varying vector fields over T cross M? What I can do that I can't do if I'm thinking about time-varying vector fields defined on T cross M is I can talk about time-varying vector fields of open subsets of T cross M, like for example, this open subset, right? All right, so that's, that's where I'm headed here. And what I'll do is kind of give you two uh, equivalent ways of thinking about what one of these things might be. So first we need to define the sheaf. And so I'll use a, a, a fact here which is kind of obvious. Um, 
but isn't it's tedious to prove, I guess I should say, because you have to check all kinds of stuff. Uh, but the basic idea I can explain to you. Okay, so we're going to use the fact that to define a sheaf on a topological space. Okay, so OS here is the set of all open subsets of S. <clears throat> okay, and so what you do when you define a sheaf is you define what the local sections over every open subset look like. But you don't actually have to tell, tell me what the sections are over every open subset. It suffices to define uh, sections over a base for the topology. Find this sheaf of time varying vector fields by telling you what it is on a base for the topology. And there's a natural base here, and that is the set of product neighborhoods. So when I say the P prime is open, um, I mean uh, in the induced topology on the interval T. Okay, so it may not be, for example, an open subset of R. But that's no problem. <clears throat> okay, so we define the sheaf. Okay, so I give it a name. So this is very much related to vector fields, and so remember we had spaces of time-varying vector fields, which I denoted like that. Okay, so things here are sheafy, so I'm going to replace the gamma with a G. Okay, like this. Um, okay, so that's how I'm going to denote this, this sheaf. Okay, and so what I need to do is I need to tell you what L, I, G, nu, T, T, M is, okay, um, on a product, on a base for the topology for T cross M. And so again, I'll use the product topology. Um, so a typical uh, open set in the product topology will be a T prime Cartesian product with a U. Okay, so I need to tell you what the local sections over that open set are, and I just define it to be L1 T gamma nu T u. Okay, the um, that's a T, not a pi. Okay, so these are the uh, locally integrally bounded, not even locally integrally bounded. The this, this, this can be L1 or L1 loc, it doesn't really matter because we're talking about sheaves, okay? So, but I'll just use L1, okay? So these are the integrally bounded uh, uh, mappings from uh, the time domain T into the space of vector fields. It's true for T prime, or T prime? Uh, definitely, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, and so then uh, uh, you can, um, associated with the construction of this for every T prime and U, um, uh, there will be an associated sheaf. So that's what I'm really defining here is that. Okay. <coughs> okay so this will be the sheaf of time varying vector fields. Okay, now, um, <coughs> excuse me, there's an alternative way to think about this. Okay. Um, because according to this definition, uh, uh, what do you get out of this? Um, well, what this will tell you is this will tell you that if you have a local section of this sheaf, okay, so if 
W is some open subset. And if you take some, let's say, T naught, uh, X naught in um, W, okay, there'll be some product neighborhood of uh, T naught, X naught. Okay, um, so we have a T prime and U. Okay, so T prime will be a neighborhood of T naught. And uh, U, uh, U will be a neighborhood of X naught. Okay. Uh, such that, okay, so what's the definition of, of how you build a sheaf from knowing it on the base here? Well, uh, um, when you have a sheaf, what you have to say is what the stocks of the sheaf are. That's how sheaves are defined. They're defined by their stocks. So um, the way you say it is you say that the stock of uh, a, a, a section of the sheaf at T naught X naught will be um, the germ of one of these guys. Okay, so what that reads is like this: so it's that if okay X is in the stock of this thing, so L I G nu of T T M sub X. Okay, so this will be the stock of the sheaf at X. Uh, sorry, at T naught x dot, <clears throat> okay, then uh, there exists an x bar in um, uh, L1, T prime, and I do to you, such that, okay, um, uh, uh, X, okay, so X remember now is a germ, okay, and what germ will it be? Well, it will be the germ of, uh, of X bar. Okay, so that's how you can think of this. But this is a little bit unsatisfactory because it only, it, it only allows you to say what germs are. What you'd like somehow to do, you'd like to think of um, a uh, section of this chief of time varying vector fields okay. uh, over an open set W as a map. Okay. So, uh, so you can define it at a given T and a given X rather than just sort of thinking about what its uh, germs look like. <coughs> and so, you can do this. And here's how you do it. Okay, so um, you, do I, I have a W, okay. Uh, we consider maps, and I'll call these maybe now script X, because these things aren't really vector fields. <coughs> so these will be mappings from W okay, into, so where do they take their values? They take their values in the, um, um, I'll do it this way to be clear, okay? This is, uh, um, you, know, you could write, you could remove the ET from this, and that would still be standard notation. Okay? But I really want to emphasize that you should think of this as being a map into the FLA space of this sheaf. <coughs> and this, these maps should have some properties. Okay, so first, x of t and x, okay, should be in the stock over x, of course. Right. Um, okay, so for fixed x, okay, 
thing. So you're going to then have a mapping which goes from t to x of tx. Okay, so t here will live in some open subset of R. Um, well, it'll live, sorry, in some uh, uh, relatively open subset of t. Okay. Okay, but the point is. Uh, um, uh, this will be a space for which it makes sense to say that this map is uh, measurable. Actually, not, not measurable, but uh, locally integrally bounded. Okay. Um, so measurable is part of that. Integrally bounded. Okay, and then two, sorry, three. Okay, so for, for so think about what this map does. So this is a map from um, some subset, let's say w uh, sub x in w, uh, sorry, in t, okay, um, and then it maps you to uh, the stock of this guy. All right. So when I say this is locally integrally bounded, I mean as a map into this locally convex space. Okay, so this means um, that it's locally Bachner integrable. <coughs> okay, using the stock topology that we talked about. Okay, and then uh, for fixed T. Okay, um, the map uh, X goes to X T uh, X. Um, so what will this map be? This will be a map from some open subset W sub T in M, okay? Um, and this will map into uh, uh, just the uh, Atello space, all right? And the stock will vary as X varies. Okay? Uh, this map should be continuous in the Atello topology. list of properties of mappings from W into the Atelier space. What's that space again? <laughs> what is that space in the parentheses? Uh, this is the sheaf of germs of C nu vector fields. Yeah. And so and this new, uh, this psi, or this new letter, this case symbol will be the new oh. vector field, basically? No this X? Yeah. Well, it's not really a vector field. But that's the thing. It's you think of it as a vector field. But that's kind of the generalization of the vector field. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. So this, so I'll, I'll tell you exactly how X corresponds to a section of this sheaf. Okay? Yeah. And these, uh, its target is separable. Uh, is the target space separable? Um, is it you're talking about this locally integrally bounded? Yeah. Um, right. Right. Um, so uh, uh, it will be effectively separable in the following sense: um, uh, that it, sometimes these stocks aren't um, Hausdorff. Right. So you quotient out by the non-Hausdorffness of that topological space. That space will be separate. Okay, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, so uh, we so for a given such map uh, X from W into uh, this guy. Okay. We define a local section of um, the sheaf of time varying vector fields. Over W, 
buy. <clears throat> okay, so this is, kind of, again, it's kind of obvious if you think about it, but you do have to think about it. <coughs> okay, so what do I have here? Um, uh, so what X does is uh, it assigns to each time T and X, uh, it assigns uh, an element of the uh, etale topology, uh, of the stock over that point. Of the atelier space, okay. All right. So what I and what will the local section of this guy do? Well, it will define for me um, uh, a germ, okay. And the germ looks like one of these guys, okay. So what I need to do is, given one of these script x's, okay, and a point uh, t and x and w, uh, I need to build one of these. Um, but that's more or less clear how you do that, okay. Um, it's only a question of whether I can do it. All right, so let's see here. Um, okay. So let's let uh, uh, T prime um, cross U be a product neighborhood. So now, what I need to do is I need to define on this T prime cross U a, a real time varying vector field. Okay, so I'll just write down a real vector field, which will be a function of time, and then you have to go and prove that it's in L1. Okay, but, but let's just write down what the vector field will be. Okay, so it's going to be a map, x bar, like that. So it's going to be a map from. Uh, prime into gamma nu to u. Okay, so it's going to be x bar, okay, um, of t, uh, okay, so x bar of t is going to be a vector field, so it'll be evaluated at a point x like that, okay. And what's that going to be? It's going to be, okay, so um, I can go like this, all right? So I can uh, fix a T, okay? Um, right, so if I fix a T, then what I get um, is uh, at that fixed T, I get a local section of the atelier space, okay? So I go X sub T, okay? So this will be a section of the atelier space, so it'll be a, a uh, a collection of germs. Okay, so really what I need to do is I need to do this. So I need to go x t. Okay. All right. So for a fixed t. Okay. This will be a local section of the FLA space of the of uh, of, of, the, of that FLA space. Okay. So uh, therefore, I can uh, evaluate the germs at points. So I can do this evaluation map at x composed with that. And what's this evaluation map? Okay, so E, V, X is a map from uh, the stock at X. Okay, so um, G, nu, T, M, X into the tangent space at X. And it just does the obvious thing. It evaluates the germ at that tangent space. Okay, so it takes All right, so the point is, this thing will be a tangent vector at x. Okay, so this gives me a legitimate time-varying vector field. Okay, and then you have to verify that that thing is L1. Okay, so the point is that this map um, establishes a correspondence between, in other words, the map which assigns one of these mappings into the germs defined by one of these mappings uh, gives me a correspondence between maps with those three properties and local sections of the sheaf of time varying vector fields. And yes, this is complicated.
such <laughs> documentation. This chief of time varying vector fields. Over W. Okay, so what was the point of this? The point of this is that this is kind of an abstract thing as it's defined. Okay? <laughs> because all you do is you just define the germs of this thing. And you really don't know what these things look like globally uh, as functions of t and, uh, and x. Okay? And this tells you how you can think of these things as being functions of t and x. And you know, rather than, So what this tells you is that rather than thinking of um, the mapping being from uh, t cross m into tm, okay, the way that you can extend this to uh, thinking about things defined on non-square neighborhoods uh, here, so arbitrary open subsets here, is you have to sacrifice having these maps be tangent space valued, okay? but you recover it by the evaluation map in the end, okay? and you have to think of these things as taking values in the uh, HLA space. Okay? So it's very much like a vector field, and you can recover tangent vectors from this thing very easily like this, Okay, but it's not a vector field in the normal sense. Well, that's the point of defining it into the HLA space. What I'm saying is that could you have not defined this i there, and this x there, to have the foundation <coughs> at x embedded in it so that it takes values in the tangent space, so you evaluate and not um, your value, basically? Um, uh, so then, uh, <laughs> uh, let me just think. Um, so what properties are you going to give to that then? Certainly it's, it's going to be different kind of properties than I have here. And essentially the properties that you're going to have essentially are going to be <laughs> the properties that originally define that. Mm -hmm. right? Around every neighborhood there's a T cross U. Right? Uh, so you're still kind of just defining them locally. Right? So in other words, the properties that you assign to those are only done locally. And here it's kind of you know, global. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the two things are... Not, it's not completely easy to show that these two descriptions are the same, right? Um, um, but it's not surprising that they're the same. It's the globalness of this description that's nice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So now, what we'll do uh, is we'll talk about flows. <coughs> All right. Um, okay, so uh, when we talk about flows, so one of the interesting things that uh, happens with flows um, is, as, as we know, flows are not globally defined. Okay, so in other words, if you have a vector field x, okay, which maps, uh, uh, which is one of these locally integrally bounded vector fields. Like so. <coughs> what all we know is that there's some domain on which this thing is defined. Okay, um, uh, and a, a flow from uh, uh, dx into m. Okay, and so uh, the, uh, the how you should think of this is that um, it takes an initial condition uh, x at an initial time t and tells you where uh, you go under the solution of the vector field at, at final time t. And so, um, you know, for, for, each, for each fixed s and t, um, sorry, for each fixed s and s, this t can change, right? So um, this domain, d sub x, in other words, it's definitely not t cross t cross m. It's not square inside t cross t cross m. It's you know kind of a, it's an open set. Okay, and so this you know kind of uh, connects with talking about things to find only on open sets. Um, uh, so you do. It's much more convenient uh, not to pretend to work globally. This is you know sort of pretend here that this is some kind of global definition because it's really not. Um, this is a generally sort of complex-looking open subset of this. Okay, 
So it's, it's uh, easier to work uh, locally. Okay? So rather than thinking of uh, flows um, as defining uh, maps from <clears throat> you know, the diffeomorphisms of M with itself, because they don't <coughs> generally, they only define local diffeomorphisms. Okay. So we'll work with uh, local diffeomorphisms, and uh, a convenient way of working with local diffeomorphisms uh, is to use the fact that um, there's a groupoid structure associated with that. Okay, so there's a groupoid structure that's associated with local diffeomorphisms. Okay, so that's one place where groupoids naturally arise here. Another place where groupoids naturally arise is that um, this map. Okay, so if you were to um, fix a T and an S, and this is going to be a local diffeomorphism now, right? So you fix the T and an S, it could be a local diffeomorphism with empty domain, okay? Um, but it'll be a local diffeomorphism. Um, and this map, okay, um, uh, uh, has a groupoid property, not a group property. If you're used to thinking about non time varying vector fields, then flows are one parameter families of subgroups of this, um, you know, when the vector field is complete, okay? Um, uh, even when everything's defined for all T and S and X, okay, this, there's no group property associated with time here. What there is is a groupoid property. All right, so groupoids come up naturally here in two places. One, when you talk about local diffeomorphisms, and then uh, another, when you talk about the time property of flows. Okay, so the point is, it's worth talking about groupoids. <clears throat> Okay. So again, I will not do this in any sort of comprehensive way, um, and I'll, I'll probably bumble my way through it uh, quite a lot, but that's okay. All right. Um, so uh, a groupoid uh, is um, over a set. B, okay, so I'll talk about just groupoids with no structure other than sort of set structures to, to start with. Um, uh, um, is a collection um, G of X, Y okay, of arrows. And so you think of these things as being mappings uh, because these things are kind of like a, a groupoid is really a category. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and there's a whole bunch of properties that have to be satisfied here, and I'll hint at them because if I try to list them all, I'll just forget some. So I'm not even going to pretend to, to list all of these. Um, but they kind of have um, uh, some natural properties. So the idea is, is that here's an X. And here's a y. So, um, what you, if you're thinking of this a groupoid as a category, b is the objects. Okay. So each x and each y is an object in this category, and then uh, g of x, y are the morphisms. So they're mappings which go from here to here. When I give examples, this will become clearer. And there may be more than one here. Okay. There may be lots of mappings here. <coughs> okay. But that's how you should think about what g of x comma y is. Okay, um, and so you have um, identity mappings. Okay, so identity mappings um, live in here. Okay, and they have sort of obvious composition properties that when you, you know, you go when you might take the arrow that goes from here to here and then hit it with the identity of y, um, you get the mapping that you started with. Okay, you take the identity to x, apply it first. And then um, uh, apply this mapping, you, you, you end up with this mapping. So those, map, those identities have the obvious properties. You also have a composition mapping, which tells you how um, uh, to go from, um, to take arrows in GXY and compose them with arrows in GYZ. Okay? So you have composition mapping like this. So it gives you the rule for assigning um, uh, uh, what you call the composition, and the composition uh, should be associative. Okay? <clears throat> so, one way to think about a group, OID, 
<clears throat> is to think of it as being a group where um, uh, the multiplication is not defined uh, uh, for every pair of elements. So you can't compose arbitrary things. There are certain rules for uh, which define the subsets of things you can compose. Okay. Inclusion. I'm sorry? And there's an, uh, I, I told you I'm not going to list all the properties, and I'm, and I'm not. <laughs> you know, yeah. Look at it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, I, if I go down the road of trying to be uh, uh, perfectly precise here, I will guarantee failure. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, uh, so let's look at some very simple examples. How do you think about a group as a groupoid? And so I should say also that uh, if you go uh, G, so there's this other set G, which is the union over uh, X, Y, uh, in B cross B of G, X, Y, okay? Um, and then you have uh, two mappings here, one which is called the source mapping, and one which is called the target mapping, okay? Um, and they have the obvious property that if you take the source mapping and you apply it to an element of this, you get X, okay? And the target mapping, you apply it to an element of this set, you get Y, okay? So the, um, you know, remember that G is an, you just think of G as being an arrow here, right? And so source gives you the um, um, origin of the arrow and uh, a target gives you the target of the arrow, okay? <clears throat> So how do you think of a group as a group point? Okay, so okay, a group is a groupoid over a single point. Okay, and then um, there's only one of these guys now, and obviously you define it to be. Uh, G. Okay. <clears throat> and then the composition mappings and the identities are, are those from G. Okay, so a groupoid uh, is a group, uh, sorry, a group is a groupoid over a single point. There's lots of very interesting examples of groupoids, and um, I'm only going to talk about the ones we're actually going to use. Um, and we're not going to use this one, this one's just an illustration. So this one we're going to use. So you have a set S, okay? So, um, uh, so then uh, the group point here G is S cross S, okay? B is S, okay? The source mapping of um, a point in G, so a point in G will be an X and a Y, let's say, is X, the target mapping, Y. Okay, and um, so now what I have to tell you is how to multiply things. Okay, so the whole point again of a groupoid structure is that the multiplications are only uh, partially defined. Okay, so the, the multiplication structure is defined uh, for X y, y prime z, when y is equal to y prime, okay? And then, okay, so how do you multiply these things? So x, y multiplied by y, z is x, z, okay? So let's think about where this comes up um, with, 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 uh, flows. Okay, so this is say that T S multiplied by S R. Okay, is T R. Okay, so for flows, <clears throat> this is saying that if you're going to compose two flows, um, the final time of this guy has to be equal to the initial time of this guy. Okay, so that makes perfect sense, right? That's when you have time-varying vector fields. 
um, the times all have to match up. Okay, so the final time has to agree with the initial time, and then so this says that. Okay, so that square group white property captures that flow property. Okay, the other groupoid that we will deal with is um, the groupoid of germs of local diffeomorphisms. Diffeomorphism, remember, uh, comes with a domain. Okay. So it's a pair of things. It's a mapping and a neighborhood. So phi is going to map um, u into m, okay, and of course, <coughs> so its image will be phi of u. Uh, this is a diffeomorphism onto its image. Okay, um, so I'm working with some regularity here, of course. So since local diffeomorphisms have neighborhoods assigned to them, okay, well this is uh, uh, a setup where germs are uh, naturally defined. say in words, the definition here is exactly like it was for um, germs associated with a, a pre-sheaf. Okay? So uh, uh, a phi and a u and a psi and a v are equivalent if there's a theta and a w where w is contained in u intersect v um, and uh, phi and psi agree with theta on uh, w. Okay? So locally they agree. Okay, and then uh, uh, the set of all equivalence classes under that equivalence relation gives you a germ. Okay. kind of like the stock of this thing okay. <clears throat> at x. Okay, but now uh, local diffeomorphisms have a different structure attached to it. They don't just have a stock structure because each local diffeomorphism you know, from some neighborhood u of x is going to map you somewhere. So there's a source map which will map you to x and then there's also a target map. union of these things. Okay. This is the groupoid <coughs> of local diffeomorphisms. So C new local diffeomorphisms. All 
right? So the groupoid structure is more or less the obvious groupoid structure, okay? So um, notice that, okay, the source of a germ, okay, will be X, okay, the target of a germ. B of X. Okay, and composition of uh, two local diffeomorphisms, B of X and Psi Y. Okay, so I should make sure I get the order right. So I'm going to write this. is defined when, of course, uh, the target of B is Y. <clears throat> okay? And the identity is the germ of the identity. Everything is there. What time is it? 15? Okay. All right. Okay, so now, um, for, the, for this groupoid, we have structure that very closely mirrors uh, the structure we have for sheaves, right? So there's some, clearly some sheafy business going on here. Uh, the source map is like the Etale projection, okay? Um, uh, uh, but we have this additional structure of the target map. Okay? Um, but uh, nevertheless, there is an etale topology on this particular groupoid, okay? and there are stock topologies, and they have more or less the obvious definitions. Again, what you do to define uh, this topology is you define a base for the topology. Okay, and this is defined for open subsets U of M and uh, local diffeomorphisms phi with domain U. Okay. And it's the obvious thing, just like it was before, where you take the germs of these guys over X's in U. Okay, so um, U is open, and V from U to M is a local diffeo. Okay, so there's an FLA topology. So here's how you can kind of picture this in your head. <clears throat> here's M, okay. <coughs> So the Etale topology um, sort of gives you structure uh, that kind of goes you know, straight up here. Okay? So let's say I have um, a U here, okay? and I have a local diffeomorphism, phi defined on U, and I take its germs. Okay? So the source map here, you can kind of think of if you want, it's kind of pointing straight down. Okay? So it'll be the source map. Okay? But the target map will map you somewhere else. So over here you'll have P of U. Okay. Alright, so this part of the structure is what defines the Etale topology, and it's very much like uh, 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 the Etale topology for uh, the Etale space of a sheaf. Okay, but here we have this additional target structure. Okay. Alright. And then you also have stock topologies. Okay, so you take an X 
in M that U is a neighborhood of X. Okay. Then you have um, uh, mappings like this. Okay, so you have C nu. Um, uh, so I should say it like this. Okay, so these are local C nu diffeomorphisms from U into M. Okay, so they're diffeomorphisms from U into M that are diffeomorphisms onto their image. Okay, so you have the, for the set of all such things like this, you can take the equivalence class of these things to give you <coughs> the germ. Okay. Okay. And then the stock topology uh, Okay, because now we have topologies for these, right? We talked about topologies um, uh, for spaces of mappings uh, between manifolds, just like we have here. Okay, so we have a topology here that we talked about already. And on here, you put, of course, and, and these are now, now not locally convex, of course. Okay, so you take the uh, final topology here in the category of topological spaces. <coughs> So it very much mirrors uh, what's going on with vector fields. Okay, so then what we'll do next time uh, is we'll talk about um, flows. So flows are going to be maps from T into this space, more or less, somehow, okay, um, uh, with certain properties. Okay? Um, and one of the things we need to talk about, for example, is absolute continuity of flows, how that shows up here, um, and then how the exponential map from spaces of vector fields into spaces of local diffeomorphisms like this, um, the properties of the exponential map. Okay, so we'll do that next time.